Hey, thanks for being part of Hill City at Home. Uh, we're so honored that we get to share this time with you. And so wherever you are, uh, if you're tuning in on your device, maybe you're with some family, some friends, maybe you're having a watch party, uh, I wanna say this, maybe send a text message to somebody right now, let them know that you are watching and have them join in with you. Uh, we believe that God is going to do something unique and special in the life of every person um, that's tuning in. And so thanks for being a part of Hill City at Home. It's gonna be a great day.
Yes, your power lives in me. Your power lives in me.
Hey, it's been really great for us to see so many of you over the last couple of weeks at our meetups. Uh, we were talking and, and one of the things that we really love is just hearing all the excitement, all the energy uh, and everything that's kind of building and swelling uh, around Hill City Church. Because here's what we believe. We believe that God has a purpose and a design for this church in this area. And we know that as we all partner, as we all do our part, as we all bring God kind of our best, we live generous lives, we return the tithe to the Lord, we know that God is going to use that and do beyond anything we could ever think or imagine. And so church, we are so grateful um, for all of you that are partnering with us, that are joining with us um, to build, to establish a Hill City Church in this area. And all of your giving is safe and secure. You can go to our website, you can text, or you can mail it in. Thank you, church, for being so generous. For sure. Hi, my name is Declan. I'm welcome to Hill City at Home. Just click the link below for Hill City at Kids. It's Hill City Kids. Oh, yeah. Hey, good morning, Hill City Church. We are so glad uh, to share this time with you. So wherever you are in the world, uh, the reality is this, is you could be doing so many other things. You could be doing a lot uh, with your life. And I know you got a lot going on, uh, but the fact that you're carving out space um, to be with us for Hill City at home uh, and also begin to kind of lean in to what God is saying and speaking to you, uh, that's a powerful thing. I don't want you to miss that. And I want you to know that we are excited um, that you are a part of this with us uh, here today. Um, if I've never got a chance to meet you before, my name is Charlie. Uh, my wife and I, we're the lead pastors of Hill City Church, and we're excited for all that God's doing. Uh, and over the last few weeks, we've really begun trying to unpack um, just the beginning stages of some thoughts, some core ideas that are really behind um, what we're building here. And, and, and we just want to, before we even start, we want to just say thank you. So many people uh, have been coming alongside, encouraging, praying for us. Uh, and providing opportunities for us to be able to bring you um, Hill City at home. And, and so I just want to thank uh, Pastors Jimmy uh, and Irene Rollins uh, and, and the whole team at, at I-5 um, for allowing us to be here uh, for their production team, helping us record to bring these um, messages to you in your home means the world to us. These are dear friends. These are kingdom-minded people, uh, but also people. Uh, I don't know if you've got people like this in your life. I hope you do. Uh, that when push comes to shove and you get ready to launch out and you get ready to do the thing that God um, called you to, uh, they're the kind of people that will stand behind you, cheering you on, uh, but also providing win uh, in your sales. And so, uh, Jimmy, uh, love you. Uh, Irene, we love you guys so much. Uh, so grateful for you. Uh, but church, if you got your Bibles, come on, why don't you get them? Uh, turn them on if you have to. If they need to be charged up, go ahead and do that. Um, but let's go to the, the Gospel of Matthew uh, the Sermon on the Mount, we've been talking, uh, really a specific passage for the last few weeks, but uh, I want to go to the very end of the Sermon on the Mount this morning, uh, and I want to read some text there that I think is just an invitation to us, uh, and something that the Lord, I believe, genuinely wants to speak uh, and put in our hearts for this season, um, for this time. Uh, and so as we say, I hope you're taking notes, uh, I hope you're writing this down, capturing really what God's saying to you uh, during uh, this sermon. Uh, but we're going to go to the Bible, Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to begin at verse 24. Uh, and, and here's what the Bible says. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and it beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So when Jesus finished saying all these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Well, church, let's bow our heads and our hearts for prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you so much, God, for your word to us. It is indeed a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. God, there's a lot of teachers and mentors and, and things that will shape us and mold us throughout the balance of our life, but there is nothing, nothing quite like your word. And so, God, we pray that we would be hearers of your word, that we would be doers of your word, and, God, that you would 
speak to us today, spirit unto spirit. And God, we know that we'll never be the same uh, if you'll do that. And in the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. What, what I love about Matthew's gospel, what I love about his writing, is he has specific intention. He has uh, really kind of a thoughtful purpose uh, in his gospel writing. In, in his letter, he is really speaking to his countrymen. He's speaking to his brethren. He's speaking to the Jewish community. And he's wanting them to understand that Jesus is not like the other teachers. He's not even like their prophets. He's, he's, he's beyond that. He, he's actually leaving them crumbs along the way so that they'll have the idea and come upon the understanding as he had that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the one that they've been waiting for. He is the promise of the Father. He is the one that will set them free, that will put things right. Jesus is he's the one. He's that, he's that guy. And, and Matthew writes with just incredible connecting points. You see, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, there is this, this picture, and, and you get it. The readers would have gotten it. Those that were there would have had this moment and this feeling. Jesus on this mountain delivering sort of this word from God. This would have, have pointed back to Moses, would have pointed back to Sinai, would have had this sense of like, man, the word of God was delivered on stone tablets in the Old Testament. But now here we have, we have Jesus who later would say that when you see me, you've seen the Father. So in, in other words, you got words on tablets in the Old Testament, but Jesus, the Word incarnate, made flesh dwelling among them, now sitting on this hill, and He is unfolding what it is to be part of the kingdom. I don't know if you, you see it and you feel it the same way as I do in this moment, but man, it's one thing to get God's message delivered to you. It's another thing for God Himself to deliver the message personally, and this is what Jesus does. It's what we see in the Gospels. So we see Matthew taking time and energy to unfold and, and make sure that they were able to make these connections. And now we're getting back to the end of, of this Sermon on the Mount. And after the, the sermon was delivered, after the, the statements were made, and it said that the people were astonished because they realized that Jesus was not teaching in the same manner that they had heard. It wasn't that he just had a different sort of style. It wasn't that he just had a different cadence or texture to his words. It, it was that Jesus spoke with an authority that was different. It's different if you walk into a room and, and you've, got, you've got the authority to be there. I don't know if you've ever experienced this in your jobs, but I think one of the worst things that ever can happen is for you to have assignments that you're actually not given the authority to accomplish. You ever been in a room where you were trying to lead some people, you were trying to move something forward, you were trying to get something to happen, and you were there like the point person, but you knew it and everyone else in the room knew it, that you actually didn't have the authority to make any of the decisions? You've ever been in situations like, like I have in moments like that, you probably quickly realized this wasn't going to go as you would hope, and it's not going to have the outcome that you were expecting. And the reality for us, friends, is that Jesus is not delivering a message that he didn't have the authority to deliver. He is delivering a message that is actually himself. He offers it to the people. And what we have to realize is the Sermon on the Mount was not just a collection of ideas, but it's an invitation to kingdom life. It's an invitation for us to pattern and model our lives after Jesus. You see, what we have to be reminded of is, is that you and I, we have to have distinction in our life. If we're Jesus people, if we're kingdom people, if we're practicing the way of Jesus together, then we have to remember that we can't use cultural patterns and hope that we will get kingdom results. Kingdom results are byproducts of a life that is submitted to Christ, that is in union and relationship with God. That it's being cultivated on the inside of us. It's, it's, being, it's being shown in community and it's being practiced as we are on mission. It happens to us in a very, very natural, in a very organic way, but we have to be intentional with it. Please, for a moment, don't hear the invitation to an organic relationship with Jesus and think that it's void of intentionality. Organic, what it simply means is that it doesn't have to be as produced as you thought. It means that your life can ebb and flow, and it means that you have an intentionality behind it. 
but you also are allowing the Spirit to lead and to guide you. I don't know if that tension bothers you, but it is one that actually exhilarates me. I love the idea that I can move towards God, and at the same time I have intention, I also get to rest and relax in the Holy Spirit and allowing Him to lead to guide us. But there's a a rhythm and a pattern that we see kind of in this text. So much of the writing of the Bible, if you can find the sort of pattern to it and you can find the rhythm to it, that speaks to us as much and really accentuates the word that Jesus uses. And I want us to see this rhythm in this text and it's first this. It's that hearing and doing versus hearing and not doing. It's very easy for us to kind of see that in the text. It's very straightforward. It's very plain. Hearing and doing versus not hearing and not doing. Then you have wise and foolish. And then you have house collapsing versus house not collapsing. Or not collapsing versus house collapsing. You see how this actually builds on one another. Don't you and I see that in our life? When we hear and we do, we become wise. When we live, when we live wisdom... What ends up happening is that our lives are secure, they're stable. But when we do the opposite, when we don't hear, when we don't listen. You remember when the Bible talks about hearing and it talks about listening, there is, there's almost the prerequisite or it's the idea that you're obeying. Your listening is actually only proved by what you do. Anybody that has kids know that's to be true. You ever talk with your kids? Ever talk with someone and they were nodding their head? Let's go one step further. Have you ever done this? Have you ever been in a conversation where someone was talking with you and you were nodding your head? And then when it got to, the, they got to a point where you actually realized that you weren't paying attention? You were pretending to listen. You were acting like you were hearing. But the reality is, is you weren't even engaged. I think many of us in our relationships with God, we go into seasons like this. We're just nodding our head. We're just going through the motions. We're just doing all the things that we think we're supposed to. But when it comes down to it, we're actually not listening or hearing what the Word of God is to us. And then we begin to live foolishly. And when we live foolishly, we see things in our life begin to fall into destruction and peril and things begin to come apart. What I love about Matthew's writing is he finds a way to point back and nudge to things that the hearers would have already known. A couple of these texts that kind of come to mind for us are, are Genesis chapter 6. Don't you remember the story of the Tower of Babel, and some of that to me is very, very fascinating, how the people gathered together, and the Bible says that they were actually able to do things that they never thought were possible because they all put their energy and their strength together, but the problem is they were doing it unto themselves. You see, many of us, we have incredible talents and incredible ability, but the problem comes when you and I rely on our own strength. And we begin to build things unto our own name. We begin to build things for our own glory rather than understanding our life was intended to be on mission. And the mission of our life is the message and the purpose of Jesus. So that a world might hear and might know those that are far from God might hear the redemptive story of Christ and they might be well. They might move from a position of not hearing and knowing to a place where they come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. You see, for us, we have to realize that this story of building and constructing, it touches on Genesis chapter 6. It also touches into the Old Testament to a psalm, Psalm 1. And I, I want you to hear the words of this psalm, and I want you to hear the words of this psalm in light of what Jesus' words were here in Matthew chapter 7. He says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaves do not wither. And all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so but are like shaft that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Do you, you see what's being said in 
in the text in Matthew, what's being said to us is we can build and construct our lives. And there is a kind of a right now meaning of that text. Listen, how you steward your life right here, right now, in this season, is absolutely going to be connected to what you reap in another, in another season. Reaping and sowing is something that we all experience, we all understand it. It doesn't have to feel like a spiritual concept that's so far uh, beyond us. The reality is what you're doing right now, you will, you will reap that in the season to come. If you're, if you're sowing wisdom, you'll reap the benefit of that. If you're sowing, sowing foolishness, you're going to reap the benefit of that. If you are constructing and building your life on a firm foundation, in another season when difficulty comes, you're going to be fortified. You see, the power of this text and what it says to us is, is really, really strong. Then don't you notice that regardless of what the foundation is, life happens the same See, building on a firm foundation doesn't mean that you're going to avoid the storm. I'm sorry that some of you, you heard a gospel and you heard a message about Jesus and following Jesus that actually equated to no storms in your life. And I want to apologize that that's the message that you heard. And I want to correct that. Here it simply is, and here's what the Bible says, storms are going to come. They're going to find the way to your house and mine. The reality is we have to be focused on building and establishing the home on a firm foundation. And the reality is this. In this narrative, there's nothing that lets us to see or believe that anyone knew how strong the foundation of the home was until the storm came. You see, many of you in this season, year 2020, somebody told you this was going to be your year. Find that person and punch them in the face. 2020 don't feel like the year we were all hoping for. Doesn't feel like the year that we all were anticipating. But can I just say to you, what if 2020 was the year that was exposing what my foundation was, what your foundation was, so that we might build our house better in 2021 than we had in 2019 and years previous? You see, what if we're supposed to do right now is when the storm comes, we're supposed to make assessment and then make changes so that our life will be firm. You could say it this way, that one, that storms reveal the condition of our foundation. You see, storms in the scriptures are often used as imagery of trial. It's also used as imagery of difficult seasons and times. Can I also say to you that in this text, it's also talking about final judgment. You see, I don't ever want us to get to a place where we think that Jesus is only concerned with your life right now. But friend, there is eternity that is in the balance, and there's eternity that we're supposed to be thinking about as well. And your life and mine, built on the firm foundation in Christ, is what will allow us to stand even in moments of judgment. Even in moments where we have to give an account. See, all through the Sermon on the Mount, it's not just an idea. It's not just an ethic for us to consider. You see, the Sermon on the Mount is, is a life for us to live. An invitation to the kingdom life. But you and I have to be careful that we don't avoid it because it requires us to change and adapt. You see, this is an invitation. You see, Matthew uses words like doing and practicing, more ordinary terms for the real word that he is, he is meaning is righteousness. You see, righteousness for us in this text simply means this, describing behaviors that will conform to God's will and then also helping us conform to the will of God in the kingdom of God. Righteousness is us forming our behavior, conforming our life to the will of God. Listen to what Jesus' brother says later on in the New Testament, James chapter 1. He says, do not merely listen to the word and deceive yourself. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and then after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever intently looks into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Obedience brings the blessing 
of God. I'll, I'll never forget that phrase. My pastor, as I was growing up, would always say that to me over and over. Charlie, obedience brings the blessing of God. Obedience brings the blessing of God. Meaning this, obedience may not keep you from trouble, but obedience will make sure that you can stand in the midst of a trial. You can stand in the midst of the storm. Can I just encourage some of you right now where you've been going through a season, you've been going through a time, maybe in your personal life, maybe in your marriage, in your relationship, you've been going through a season where it feels like the storm is coming and you've been thinking you're facing a storm because you're out of favor with God or you're out of relationship with God. You might just be experiencing a storm because God's trying to prove to you that your foundation is sturdier than you thought it was. That God's wanting you to see, no, no, you're on a firm foundation or just maybe the Lord is using the season to teach all of us that our foundation needs to be strengthened more because the winds and the waves, it's certain that they'll come. But we have, we have to be rooted. We've got to be firm in this foundation. You see, it's, it's, it's a temptation for us to take this message of Jesus and we turn, we turn what should be Christology, we turn what should be the way in which we think about Christ, we turn it into just an ethic and we begin to debate that. You understand that if you devolve Christology into an ethic, what you'll begin to do, what I'll begin to do is find ways that we can cut the corners. We'll say things like this, oh, that's what Jesus said, but I don't think that's what he meant for us right now. Don't be tempted, friends, to take the words of Jesus and sanitize them. Don't be tempted to read your Bible with a black Sharpie rather than a yellow highlighter. You see, there are sometimes when you come to the words of Jesus, and listen to me, if you're not uncomfortable with the words of Jesus, you're not reading it right. That's why I could spend so much time in the Sermon of the Mount personally. Why? Because there's so much in it that I find difficult. There's so much in it that's not common. There's so much in it that's not normal. And I just have this belief that if us as a church, as Hill City Church, is we can root ourselves on the message and the teachings of Jesus, and we'll allow that to get into our life and it will be our foundation, then there is nothing that this world can provide by way of opposition that we will not be able to withstand. We will be salt and light. We will have the ability to impact. We will have the ability to restore and redeem for the glory of God. But you and I have to make sure that we are on mission and that we are rooted. Jesus' final words, he says, therefore who hears these words of mine. Most of us quote authors and we quote things that we've read before or studied and we've gathered it. Solomon says it this way, there's nothing new under the sun. So the reality is, is we all have this danger of we plagiarize and borrow and we don't even know we're doing it. If you're like me, I talk in movie quotes a lot. I talk in song lyrics. I, I, it's someone else's words. It's someone else's phrases. You know what I love about the Sermon on the Mount and the teachings of Jesus? They're his words. Not borrowed. They're his words. Where, where do his words, where do his words rank in your life? We've all got people in our life whose words matter to us. The older I'm getting, the fewer, the fewer people whose words matter. Right? When you're younger, everyone's opinion matters. When you're younger, everyone's idea it, it affects you and it, and it puts you off or it puts you in a, in a good mood. Like I'm just telling you, the older I'm getting, I'm just realizing, man, the, the number of people whose voices actually, actually matter in my life, it, they're, they're fewer and far between. It's not what it used to be when I was 20. But the reality is, is where does Jesus' words, where do they land in your life? Do they have the ability to dis disrupt? Do they have the ability to change, to alter? Do they have the ability to inspire you, to drive you in a place, in a way that you never thought possible? You see, the words of Jesus have to, have to impact us. They have to matter to us because they're an invitation. An invitation for us to not simply be and become our own ideas, but for us to, to embrace the call of God on our life. You see, the danger is that we think only a few are called, only a few are 
appointed as disciples, or a few are, are supposed to carry the gospel message. You see, the mistake for us is that we think we can outsource not just our own spirituality, but that we can actually outsource kingdom work to other people, and we don't take the personal invitation for ourselves to take our place as the city on a hill. And I'm just asking you, what are you building, and how are you building your life? Jesus is asking us to build it on a firm foundation. If you took inventory and you audited your life right now, how is the foundation? What are you built on? Are you built on your ability? Are you built on your education? Are you built on your resume? Are you built on, on all of your accomplishments? And they may and probably are impressive and many. But at the end of it, that's shifting sand. The firm foundation that is in Jesus says that I take the foolish things to confound the wise. I take the things that, that are simple and it actually becomes the thing that fortifies me and strengthens me in a way like I've never known before. Church, the invitation for us is to build not just our lives, not just our families, not just our communities, but to build this church, to build Hill City Church on the firm foundation that is in Jesus. Not in an idea, not in a denomination, not in any of these other sort of structures that we might, but on Jesus and His words and His teachings. And that is something that we can give our life to, knowing that it's not just simply going to fold like a house of cards. It's not simply going to be swept away in the winds of culture, but that it is going to be firm and it is going to last. I get excited when we talk about Hill City Church because I truly believe that this church is going to outlast me. That this is going to be a church that's going to, going to be around for generations to come. And when you and I are no longer here and, and we're just an idea, we're the group of people that in 2020, in the middle of a pandemic, decided to launch a church called Hill City. When our church is thinking back to this day, and we're not, not even in the room. Maybe we're in the sweet by and by singing songs with Jesus. That we'll, we'll be able to celebrate because we're establishing something that's rooted in Jesus, our firm foundation and it has no ability to be swept away. What about your life? What about your family? What about, what, about, what about you right now? Where are you? Are you firmly rooted in Christ, or do you feel yourself beginning to shake as the winds and the waves and the storm comes? Because, friends, we all know the storms will come. They have come. They're coming. But we don't have to fear them because our God is a firm foundation. The Bible says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run into it and they are made safe. Church, would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and for your mercy. I thank you, God, for a simple invitation to build our life on a firm foundation. To not trust our own understanding, but to, uh, to lean on you in all of our ways, acknowledge you, and the Bible says you'll make our path straight. You're a strong tower, you're a refuge. You don't call us to build things unto our own name. But you desire us to build things in your name. On your name. And for your name. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. Just take a moment to kind of search your heart. What's your foundation like right now? Do you feel strong and sturdy? Or do you feel a little bit shifty? You feel a little bit insecure? Listen to me. If you're feeling a little bit insecure, you're feeling a little bit sort of shaky in this season, can, can I just right now, in, in this moment, in the name of Jesus, first I want to speak peace to you. I want to speak peace to your heart and to your mind. The storm is real. Peace doesn't mean we ignore the reality. Peace means in the midst of the reality, I can have a calm. So right now, if you're feeling you're feeling that disruption. I just speak peace over your life. But right now, this is a moment. I believe that the Lord is carving this moment out for you, for me, to make the decision. We're going to decide to build our house, our spiritual house individually, 
Corporately, our, our church home, our family's home, all of these sort of houses, we're building them on the rock. We're making that decision. I want you just to simply say this. I'm building my house on the rock. Go ahead and say that with me. I'm building my house on the rock. Jesus, we make the decision today. It's Hill City Church. God, we will always build our house on your name, in your name, and for your name. And God, we'll do this in our personal lives. We'll do this in our families and in our communities. And God, we'll do this. We'll do this for your house, for your church. In the name of Jesus, we pray. We ask all these things. Amen. Church, may you know that regardless of what the storm looks like, feels like, sounds like, that your foundation in Christ is stronger than the winds that are coming against you. That the voice of Christ is truer than the sound of the wind that is coming against you in the waves that are crashing on every side. May you know that that Jesus is with you and for you and he is your firm foundation now and forevermore. Grace and peace, church. We love you so much. We'll talk to you soon. Hey, Hill City Church. I hope that message resonated with you today as much as it did with me. And we just want you to know that we are here to take that next step with you. Or maybe you have a question. You can email us at info at hillcitydc.com. And make sure to follow us on social media or sign up on the website to keep up to date with all that is happening here at Hill City. We hope to see you soon.